So here we are at the last, in the last chapter of Unit 6. Um, we have talked about fossil fuels. We have talked about conventional um, renewable energy alternatives. And now we're going to talk about the new renewable energy alternatives. Whoops, a little crazy there. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what they are, what their future potential is. And we're going to talk specifically about th four kinds of new alternative energy sources, uh, solar, wind, geothermal, and hydrogen fuel cell. Um, the ones we talked about in the last chapter are conventional alternatives to fossil fuels like hydropower and biomass. They're renewable, um, but they can be depleted. Um, and they do give us some negative environmental impacts, kind of like we talked in the last um, chapter. If we look at um, energy from the sun, so solar energy, wind energy, geothermal, and ocean water, um, you can use tides and stuff for um, power, but we're not going to worry about that too much in this chapter. Um, they're considered new renewable for the reasons that you see there. They're just being used on a wider scale. You know, solar's really only been much of a thing in the last 10 years or so. Um, the technology that they, we use to harness it is really developing rapidly. Um, so they're only gonna get more efficient in the future, which kind of, the, which makes the last bullet kind of make sense. They're only, as they become more efficient and more um, economically feasible, they're gonna become much bigger roles in the future. So um, renewable energy sources are growing kind of quickly in terms of um, how we use them. If you look at overall U.S. consumption of renewable energy sources, renewables for overall energy sources uh, are 9.9 percent of our total um, energy usage. Most of it is fossil fuels, which we know. Um, bioenergy is used in a lot of cases um, for energy overall, um, followed by hydropower, wind, solar, and geothermal. But if you look at alternative ways just to generate electricity, we get most of our, um, all, we use um, hydropower and wind for the most part when it comes to um, alternative energy sources used for re, um, electricity generation, okay? Solar is probably a little higher than that by now. Um, wind has gotten bigger and bigger every year. Um, but solar is actually growing faster, which kind of makes sense because the technology has gotten a lot better. Um, why do we bother using renewable energy resources? Well, you guys probably already know the answer to this. Uh, we have fewer air, um, less air pollution, right? The air pollutants that come out of it are less significant. It reduces greenhouse gases, the ones that we just talked about that deal with global climate change. Um, and we have some diversity in terms of um, the energy mix per, um, that the, a, a particular economy requires, which is um, good for competition. Um, if you, as we start to shift toward renewable energy, um, you're going to have jobs that in industries that didn't exist before. Um, when I started teaching, um, you know, in 1999, they said that um, the jobs that kids that are graduating from high school in 20 years, which is you guys, um, the jobs that those kids are going to have when they finally hit the work world, they don't exist, right? So it was a, there was a big push and there still is a push um, because of the how rapidly the world is changing um, and, and things are evolving and, and technology is developing. Um, there was a big question and a big push for us to figure out how to educate kids for a job that didn't exist. So it's more about skills and practices and your ability to like gather information rather than specifically knowing how to do something. You guys know that you can Google stuff. Um, you don't need to, to memorize specific content when you're out in the real world, um, but it's more about your, your critical thinking skills and your skills of analysis and your research, skill, research skills um, and your, your ability to, to develop creative thought. Um, so that's what I try to do. But the jobs that are in this um, in this green energy industry are called green collar jobs, blue collar jobs, white collar jobs, and now they're coming up with green collar jobs. My bet <coughs> is that a lot of you guys um, who are interested in this kind of thing are going to wind up dealing with 
renewable energy sources um, in some form or fashion, which is really kind of cool to me. Um, so some things that will support renewable energy use, you can take a look at them there. Uh, governments need to invest in R&D, um, you know, for uh, renewable energy startup businesses to give them some seed money. Um, and tax credits is, is a big thing for individuals and businesses um, who get their energy or create their energy uh, renewably rather than through fossil fuels. So in lots and lots and lots of cases, and this is one of my biggest beefs with the fossil fuel industry, um, governments have subsidized fossil fuels and nuclear power, um, which, which makes the playing field uneven, all right? So fuel oil and gasoline and petroleum is artificially inexpensive because the government has given the, the um, oil companies incentives to keep it that way. Um, so if you look at the pie chart there, the total subsidies, you know, in, the, in that period of time, from 1918 to 2009, the oil and gas industry got almost $450 billion of um, subsidies. Now, comparatively, and nuclear did too, but for not quite as long, about half the time. So about half the time, a little less than half the subsidy. Um, I doubt that biofuels and new renewables, if you let the subsidies go, if you were to add the subsidies up for the same amount of time as oil and gas and nuclear, uh, I don't think they would have quite as many um, subsidies. So oil and gas have received 75 times more subsidies and nuclear power has 31 times more than um, renewable. But a lot of that could be based on the timing rather than um, the actual quantity of money. Because obviously if you get money over a longer period of time, you're going to wind up with more money. So annually, okay, uh, so they, they understand that this is deceiving. So if you break it down annually, you take care of it. Um, four, 13 times more subsidies for oil and gas and nuclear um, as compared to renewables. And then uh, nuclear is like nine times more. So that's one of the big things that we're facing. In a single year, did solar, wind, and geothermal together get as much as oil, gas, or nuclear? So the playing field is uneven. The playing field is really uneven. And honestly, it shouldn't be, um, because this is, this is what we need to kind of help us solve this climate change thing, at least start to work towards it. So Captain Obvious, here we go, slide 11. Solar energy is the energy from the sun. This is, this in and of itself is a stunning statistic and it's the reason why I think we need to be spending more uh, on solar. Every day, the earth receives enough solar energy from the sun to power human consumption for 25 years, every single day. So we could figure out a way to collect solar energy and convert it into electrical energy. Um, it's like a game changer for us. So it's, um, that's the big challenge. So we can collect solar energy in two ways. One is passive solar energy. So it's, ener it's like designing your house or designing a building in ways to capture solar energy, um, to get as much sunlight as you can in the winter and um, making the interior cooler in the summer. So um, the picture there kind of shows you things. You can uh, plant vegetation, to create a temperature buffer. Um, you can create, um, you can use materials to like, um, that are designed to absorb heat and then radiate it slowly. Um, when we built my house, we upgraded our insulation, um, which has reduced our energy bills significantly. Um, we uh, installed a better furnace, a more efficient furnace, which um, reduces the amount of fossil fuels that we use. We have a very, very good oil burner. Um, and we also put low E glass in our windows. We upgraded our windows to low E glass. So um, it does a really good job of keeping the heat out, all right? So, um, or uh, keeping like the outside out and the inside in, okay? It does a really good job of that. So in the winter time, um, 
you know, my room is south facing. So in the wintertime, we open the curtains um, and let that low winter sun, you know, come in and warm the upstairs so we don't have to run the heat as much. In the summertime, we keep those closed. The sun is higher in the sky, but we still keep um, our curtains closed. Um, they're the, the blackout curtains, so it, it, it does a really good job of keeping it cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. So we did that on purpose. Um, the opposite, the other side of solar uh, power is active solar energy. And this is kind of like more what you think when you think solar. Um, you've got these solar panels, okay? And they uh, make use of a particular device. And you can see on the roof there, it's a flat plate solar collector. Um, and you can use this um, <coughs> for as a hot water heater. Okay, so you can transfer it to tanks um, and then it can go to tap water, it can go, you know, wherever it needs to be. So you actually have equipment that collects the solar energy um, and will allow that to happen. Uh, concentrated solar power is where you take solar energy from a big area and you focus it on a single point. If you guys have ever made hot dog cookers with like aluminum foil and boxes, um, that's exactly what a, what, that's concentrated solar power. Erin made um, uh, s'mores that way uh, when she was in second grade, I think, in her gifted and talented class. So they roasted marshmallows over um, a, uh, a solar cooker like that, not quite that big. But it's, it's a legitimate way of harnessing solar energy. <coughs> so um, you can concentrate solar power in a bunch of ways. All right, where you can um, focus uh, the rays of the sun on um, various ways and then use that concentrated energy to um, turn water into steam, to turn turbines, to generate electricity. Um, but it's all where that heat is coming from. And power towers do that, okay? Um, so this is one in, in Spain, in southern Spain, um, where they focus all the solar energy there um, to heat water to turn a turbine to generate electricity. The movie Gattaca had one of these in it too, if you've ever seen that. So um, those are ways to take solar energy and convert it in a, a PV cell, a photovoltaic cell. Um, it directly generates electricity. Um, electrons get, you know, excited as the solar energy hits them. Um, they move across silicon plates and um, will generate electricity. So that's how that works. What are the good things about solar energy? Well, here they are. Um, you know, the Earth, the sun, sorry, is not going to go um, red giant for about 5 billion years. So it actually works out really well. Um, in, in human terms, the solar energy is inexhaustible. Um, and there's plenty of it. We have a great supply of it. So it's going to keep hitting the earth and hitting the earth and hitting the earth. Um, so we're not going to run out. Um, we don't need any fuel. There, isn't, there aren't really moving parts to solar energy, so it doesn't require a lot of maintenance. You get lots of green jobs right, for installing solar panels, you know, engineering them, designing them, everything, all at all levels of education, um, you know, from an installer all the way to a designer. And you don't get greenhouse gases or other pollutants, um, which is really a good thing. But there are downsides. Um, and most of it is, like they say, location, location, location. You can take a look at um, the amount of solar radiation you know, that different areas of the United States and Germany and Spain, as you can see on the right there, get in the course of a year, right? So solar is a thing here. Like lots of houses around here have solar panels. Um, in Germany, in Northern Germany, it's really not a thing. Like it's not feasible because you don't get as much sun there. In the, in the, um, the Southwest, in the US, Arizona, Southern California, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, oh yeah. It's totally a thing. Solar is totally a thing there. And in the southern parts of Spain. 
all right? But it's not gonna work well in Alaska where like north of the Arctic Circle, north of 60 degrees latitude, it's dark for half the year. It's definitely not feasible there, all right? So that's one of the big issues with it. Um, and even in places like Arizona, right, where it's, it's compared to here, it's sunny a lot of the time, um, there are seasonal variations in sunlight as you know the earth goes around the sun and axial tilt and all that stuff um so it makes it really hard to provide consistent energy without storage capacity um, and that's one of the big things with solar is that how, how do you store that energy like to supply to run like things at night it's gotten better um but there's still a lot of improvement that's necessary before it becomes a really feasible thing and the other thing is solar equipment is expensive to buy it to install it um, but if you're looking more long term you're going to wind up with um, installations that pay for themselves within 10 or 20 years so there are good sides to it too all right wind here we go so wind is generated is power is wind power is power generated by wind so it's, it's created by um, different uh, air masses that are heated differently, okay? So differences in temperature create differences in pressure like we looked at with the isobars. Um, and then um, that'll create wind. So turbines, these wind turbines are um, the windmills that create the energy. They convert wind energy, mechanical energy into electrical energy. So the blades are these parts that stick out. The tower is the post that it stands on. And the thing that kind of looks like a bullet is called the nacelle, all right? So the blades turn, which turns a gearbox, which, tur which um, turns a generator. There's no steam here, okay? It's all um, mechanical energy. So um, the turbines don't just sit um, stationary. They, the word is yaw. Or it's like it's like turning your head back and forth on your neck. Okay, the the tur the uh, turbine is going to move like that. It's going to rotate back and forth as the wind changes direction, which kind of really increases increases efficiency and ensures that that nacelle um, is pointing into the wind direction at all times. Um, the speed of the wind really does have a great uh, influence on electricity generation. If you double velocity, the power output goes up eight times, just the way it's designed. So the faster the wind blows, the more power you get. And turbines are <laughs> erected in groups, and that group is a wind farm, which is kind of cool. Um, this is a big thing now. Instead of putting the uh, wind farms on land, um, they're starting to put them more and more offshore. Um, wind speed is greater offshore, and you have a lot less turbulence because as the air moves over the land, as the land goes up and down, you know, vertical changes in elevation, um, the air gets more turbulent. Um, but the one problem with it, some, you know, I went to, I was in Ocean City two summers ago, Ocean City, Maryland, two summers ago, and I'm sitting on the beach and you know how they have those planes that pull the banners. Um, one of them was totally against this because you know they're, they're talking about putting them offshore in Maryland. And when um, I'll tell you that in a second. So one of them was like stop, stop the wind farm with a website pulled behind this little prop plane. And then the next one that came about 15 minutes later was we want the wind farm or something like that. So I couldn't even go on vacation and not be thinking about environmental science. Um, but when I went to my AP Summer Institute at Rutgers, I went to the um, oceanography lab that's there. And um, the team that runs like the um, like mini submersible, mini submarine devices, I can't remember what they're called. Um, they are mapping the sea floor from like Block Island down to um, Northern Virginia to find good spots to put wind farms like this. Um, so the initiative is coming and I really think it's something that they're definitely gonna do um, in the future. A lot of people complain because 
they think you can see them from the shore. You can't really see them from the shore. They're way, way offshore. You need to get away from that um, land turbulence in order for them to work really well. So benefits of wind power. Why is it such a good thing? You can take a one megawatt wind turbine and this is everything that you don't put into the atmosphere compared to like burning coal, which is fabulous to me, okay? Um, they produce, this is another thing, they have a huge EROI, okay, energy return on investment. They produce 20 times more energy than they consume. So it's a really good investment. Um, you can also, if you wanted to increase wind power, it's very easy. You just put more turbines out there and you're going to get more, um, more power out of it. Um, but there's a problem with it. There are problems with it. Um, it's intermittent. You know, some days are windier than others. You guys have been around long enough to know that. Certain areas, okay, have really great potential for wind power. The coasts, right? Not so much down around Florida, but like down to Northern Virginia, even into North Carolina, up and down the West Coast, okay? Even some on the Great Lakes because they're so stinking big. And the whole Midwest, okay? If you ever, if you know the, the musical Oklahoma, it goes Oklahoma where the wind comes whipping down the plains. Well, here you go. It's a perfect spot for, um, for wind energy, okay? And some of the, the mountainous areas too, you can put them on tops of mountains. Um, so you're not, the problem with this, right? Let me go back to this. The problem with this, if this is the biggest spot for wind generation, and we know, based on our study of climate change, that a huge portion of the U.S. population lives along the coast. Whoops, sorry, guys. A huge part of the U.S. population lives along the coast. We have to create infrastructure to take this energy where it's created and population is low and transport it to the coasts where population is high. So we need to have infrastructure for that. Um, when wind farms are put near population centers, like cities and, and developed areas, or even offshore, people think they're ugly, right? So this is a, full, uh, an, a way of thinking called NIMBY, not in my backyard, all right? So they want the benefit of it, but they don't want it in their backyard. Um, another thing about wind turbines that was actually a question on one of the AP tests in the past, asks um, a down, for a downside of wind. And one of the things in the scoring guide was they pose a threat to birds and bats, okay, which um, happens when they fly into the blades. Statistically, it's not a huge number of birds and bats that die. Uh, but current research has figured out that if you paint one of the turbines, the blades, black, there's a much lower um, risk of uh, impact by birds and bats. So there's a solution to the problem for the birds and the bats. All right, geothermal, the next kind we're gonna talk about. Geothermal, geo is earth and thermal is heat. So what you're doing is you're tapping into the heat that exists below the earth's surface, okay? Um, you can look at ground temperatures, subsurface temperatures here. Um, here where we are, you know, geothermal is not really a good thing because the, the, the temperatures below the surface aren't really all that warm, okay? Um, you have some uh, in this area of the Earth, of, of the United States. This is from a failed rift zone, okay? It was called the, it's called the New Madrid Rift Zone. Um, anywhere where you see red and yellow is evidence of former tectonic activity. So this is like the heat under Yellowstone. This is the heat under Yellowstone, and this is all like the, the rise of the, the Rocky Mountains. This here is a result of um, a rift zone between Baja California and Mexico, all right? So in order for it to be effective, you need magma below the surface at a relative shallow depth, okay? Um, so we, you can do a couple things. Um, you can directly drill down into the water that's trapped in a confined aquifer, all right, which is how you get geysers and stuff. Um, so that steam comes up, it turns a turbine to make electricity, and then um, that water cools in the cooling tower, 
and then it's injected back down into the aquifer to maintain its pressure, okay? You wanna keep this aquifer um, confined, so that way you have the pressure of the steam coming up, so you have to put it back in. So that's uh, how a geothermal power plant works. And there's one of them, Iceland. It uh, makes a ton of sense that Iceland should have huge amounts of geothermal power. It's the mid-ocean ridge, mid-Atlantic ridge at the surface. Magma is right below the surface, relatively speaking. Um, so they um, take it and then they uh, ship it off to um, Reykjavik in Iceland. And how, then they use that steam, they make the steam, they ship the steam off to turn a turbine to generate electricity. Um, so you can use another, another way of using geothermal is something called a ground source heat pump. So rather than pulling water directly out and then putting water directly back in after you um, take the steam to turn the turbine to generate electricity, uh, you can do, use something called a ground source heat pump. So um, you run um, water down in, okay? And then um, the water gets warmed up by the ground itself. So in the summertime, you're gonna pump warm water down. It's gonna cool because it's warmer under, it's cooler underground than it is above ground in the summer. If you guys have ever been down into a cave, you know that. So then that cool water comes back up and circulates um, to make, uh, to cool your house. All right, in the winter time, you have the opposite. So the cold water goes down, the same water temperature, the same temperature underground is warmer than it is above the ground. So then that heats the water and then that water um, can heat your house. So if we were to do geothermal around here, this is how we would do geothermal, but, but there's not a big enough difference in temperature um, for it to really be effective. Again, pros and cons, costs and benefits. Um, when geothermally heated water comes up, okay, if it gets exposed to the air, it can release dissolved gases. Look at what it's releasing. Carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide, okay? So it can get out. So some of these are greenhouse gases, but the amount that comes out of geothermal, if any escapes, is much smaller than what we would see from fossil fuel combustion. So it's a better alternative. It's renewable, geothermal is renewable. So as long as there's heat underground, we're good. But if you, if plants are pulling that, that steam up faster than it can be reheated by the magma, um, it's not gonna be renewable. And this is the big thing for me, the Earth's crust is changing, right? Tec we are a tectonically active planet. So the one, one of the downsides for me is that Okay, so Yellowstone is tectonically active now. It's been tectonically active for a long time. How long is it gonna stay tectonically active? You know, is, is, are the plates gonna shift in a drastic way that's gonna make it not feasible, okay? So that's some of that. The last kind we're gonna talk about are hydrogen fuel cells. Um, this is really, really cool. Um, when we talk about renewable energy, it's really hard to store energy in large quantities for use. So solar powered cars aren't a thing because how are you gonna store that solar energy to power the car when the sun isn't out? Uh, fuel cells are what we use um, uh, to do that. So they use hydrogen as a stored power source. So there are two, um, capsules, cells, two parts to it, two reservoirs. I don't even know what you wanna, how you wanna talk about it, but two parts, okay? Um, so hydrogen molecules are in a, um, a part of it, a cell, all right? So um, they're stripped of electrons, it's, it's charged. So it's they're stripped of electrons at the negative electrode. So then they become protons, right? They are gonna pass across um, the negative electrode to the positive electrode. They're gonna create a current which is gonna generate electricity. So here's an electrical current. When they cross um, from across the positive electrode, um, there's oxygen that comes in, 
okay, to the system. And then that positive hydrogen ion is going to combine with atmospheric oxygen and create water. So the waste that comes out of a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is water, which is pretty amazing. Okay. It produces water. So there's no pollution. All right. There's no pollution. If we can do this, if we can make our vehicles hydrogen fuel vehicles, right? We're reducing our dependence on foreign fuels significantly. And we're also reducing greenhouse emissions that could lead to climate change. Again, we're putting, but we're putting more water into the atmosphere, right? As well as exhaust. Is that going to cool the planet or is that going to exacerbate it like we talked about in chapter 18? Lots and lots of cities, lots of cities have um, started turning their public transportation into um, hydrogen fuel cells, um, which is really a cool idea. Um, you got to make hydrogen fuel, all right? Uh, you need to use electrolysis to split water to make hydrogen and oxygen, and that's the process. Um, depending on how um, you need to generate hydrogen to make the fuel cells, the hydrogen tanks, um, the cleanliness of the, um, of the hydrogen fuel cell is directly connected to where that hydrogen came from, okay? Did it come from fossil fuel combustion or did you create, did you allow electrolysis to happen um, through a new renewable energy source? You can get hydrogen out of other molecules like methane and it's gonna make the energy cheaper, but it's also gonna be uh, more dirty. Um, and I kind of explained to you how that goes. So I don't have to talk about that. Again, pros and cons. So there are pros in terms of reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, but if we were to take the nation's entire infrastructure, okay, the entire infrastructure and turn it to hydrogen fuel, it would be really, um, it would be a huge undertaking because it's really expensive to um, have those kinds of things. You would need a place to fill up your tank. Like here, we you go to a gas station. You would need a hydrogen fuel, hydrogen cell gas station. Um, and they have a lot of them in California, as I found out, um, you know, last year. And then if you have hydrogen that leaks into the atmosphere, um, you could wind up depleting stratospheric ozone um, and then making methane last even longer in the atmosphere. So again, as with everything, there are pros and cons. Benefit-wise, it is the most abundant element in the universe. Most of the universe is hydrogen. So we're not going to run out, like we're going to run out of fossil fuels. Um, you don't get air pollution. You just get water vapor. But there's a downside to that, potentially. And they are really, really efficient, super efficient compared to internal combustion engines. Um, 35 to 70 percent of the energy from the reaction can be used. And I don't. I don't remember the specific number for um, internal combustion, but it's a lot less than that. So my friends, that wraps up unit six. Um, hopefully you got some good information out of it.